Welcome to the first Arcangelo podcast. My name's Julian Forbes. I'm the general manager of Arcangelo. And for this first episode, I'm delighted to be joined via Zoom by Kate Lindsay, the mezzo-soprano and feature soloist on the album Ariana, recorded with Arcangelo last year and released earlier this year on Alpha Classics. We're going to be talking about the dreaming, recording uh, and making of Ariana. But before we come to that album, Kate, I wanted to start by asking you about your previous album, which is very different to Ariana in almost every way, and how you made the journey from that project to this one. Yeah, I guess I guess if one is looking at the sequence of an artist's recordings, this probably <laughs> would leave one a little bit a little bit flummoxed, I would like to say sometimes. Yeah, the first recording I did was called Thousands of Miles and based on the work of Kurt Weil. And within that I use the music of Zimlinski, Korngold, and Alma Mahler as well. And it was it was thing actually for me that was a bit out of left field. I really hadn't considered investigating Court Vile because I, I, in a way, I felt it was too American. But I, I, I sort of owe that to Didier Martin, who put together the disc. He, he threw a couple of ideas at me, and one was Court Vile and one was Charles Ives. I thought, hmm? What? And in a way, it was quite serendipitous because I love that period. I, I love the early 20th century, heavily romantic, expressive, tense harmonies. But I, I did worry, would people's perception of me as an opera singer all of a sudden be jarred as a result? And I just thought, if I, if I do this, I have to go wholeheartedly into it stylistically and give myself over to it. And I have really started to approach things within work from the sense that if, if it scares me a little bit, I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> if I think there's going to be something to overcome in this, then I'm much more interested in, in going for it. And so thousands of miles really gave me the confidence to go there. And of course, I was working with Baptiste Trottignon, who is a jazz pianist. So both of us were crossing the lines over into each other's world. He was moving over, playing the Korn Gold and Zimlinski and playing strictly from what was written on the paper. And then I was moving into the freer form jazz style. And so it was really, it was really valuable. You realize there's much more freedom in music making than we sort of necessarily allow ourselves. And so then that brought me, I was thinking about what to do for another album. And the thing I definitely knew was that I wanted to do something completely different. I, I knew that I needed something that sort of challenged me in a, in a completely new way, but also I wanted to be able to work with really, really great musicians that are really about collaboration because that's what I enjoyed so much on the, on the first album. And it's what I enjoy, every, what I most enjoy in, in a project is always about the connection you feel with the musicians and the orchestra and the conductor. Speaking of the conductor brings us to Arcangelo's conductor and artistic director, Johnny Cohen. For a project all about an abandonment, it's actually one that really stands under the sign of reunion because you and Johnny first met and worked together several years before. Uh, when did you first meet Johnny? I first met Johnny when, um, when I was making my European debut, singing Carabino in The Marriage of Figaro, uh, in 2008 at Opera Lille. And Johnny at that time was assisting Emmanuel Ayin. And it was a really young cast. It was Matthew Rose singing Figaro, Jacques Imbrilo singing The Count, Hélène Guilmet singing Susanna, and Nicole Heaston Lane was singing The Countess. And all of us were able to, you know, hang out, hanging out um, all the time. And there was a nice little cafe right beside the stage door. So at the end of rehearsals, each day we'd all go out and have a, have a little beer out at this little cafe. And I, I have never forgotten sitting there and Johnny spoke really, really, really clearly about the fact that he wanted to form his own orchestra. I remember this quite distinctly because I sort of looked at him and I thought, wow, he's, 
he's really clear on this. I was really impressed that somebody could have such a clear vision starting out and be so confident. And I, I've been hoping that there'd be a way to be able to make music together in our own right, because it's quite special to be able to work with somebody who is your contemporary in age as well. It, it just opens the door to even sort of a deeper collaboration. Now, although you were looking for something completely different on this project, one reviewer noted your several appearances in Ariadne auf Naxos by Richard Strauss and wondered if that stage time might have played some part in the germination of this project. Any truth in that? I think there is something to that. I, I have done quite a few productions of Ariadne auf Naxos, singing the composer. The composer only sing, sings in the first half, but... Um, more and more people use the character of the composer as a silent witness to the events with, within the second half. Um, and so that has left me with a lot of days in rehearsal without the responsibility of having to sing, but having to sit and be a part of or be observing the action. And I've thought a lot about her as I've as I've watched her and as I've watched many people work through that character. And in, and in relation to that, I'd always wanted to do Haydn's Ariana Anaxos. So that was sort of my starting point was I thought I, I would love to do this piece by Haydn. And not only that, I'm so interested in this character. And I think I, I think I know something about her now. I'm really interested to hear you say that you had always wanted to do Haydn's Cantata because it's not an especially well-known piece, certainly not in its orchestrated version, but you had obviously known about it for some time. Uh, how did you first discover it? I was introduced to it actually many, many years ago when I was in the Met Young Artist Program. I just, I remember these little tidbits of people saying to me, oh, one day you should look at this piece. But what I didn't sort of know what, was that the common practice was with piano only. In my mind, I knew it, I knew it could be a really effective dramatically, the piece could be really effective dramatically if I, if I could do it with orchestra. The next piece to drop into place during the planning process was the Handel Cantata a Crudel. How did you discover and choose that one? I was looking, I was looking for, for Handel cantatas, but I didn't want to do things that had been heavily done before, as well as the fact that I wanted something in terms of text that really lined up with the, with the Haydn. Um, and I just wanted something I felt that I could connect to. And so I was, I was listening to a lot sort of my, the first singer I always turn to if I want to hear things, I always look to Janet Baker because of the, the incredible artistry, the ability for the voice, the voice to emote. And yet there's also, the music is made with such reverence. And so I was listening, I was looking at a lot of her recordings because she recorded so extensively. And I came across that recording and I listened to it and I, I loved the life of the music. Um, I loved the personality. And when I was listening to it, I was sort of dancing along <laughs> as well. It, 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 sort of, it lifted me up and I, I thought this, this has something to it. And so we come to the Scarlatti. I should say for anybody who's not yet listened to the disc, my personal recommendation would be to start uh, with the Scarlatti. It's a wonderful piece of music. All of Scarlatti's chamber cantatas, and he wrote hundreds, are worthy of investigation because it's where he really expressed himself musically most personally. One academic says of Scarlatti that operas he wrote to please the Spanish court in Naples or a Medici prince in Florence or the opera-going public of Venice, but chamber cantatas he wrote to please himself and in them the most profound of his musical ideas were given expression. And the, the same person goes on to compare Scarlatti's chamber cantatas to John Dowland's lute songs, a very intimate, personal form of music. So, Kate, I was wondering, could you tell us about how the Scarlatti came to join and complete the programme? 
Um, the Scarlatti actually was discovered because we all of a sudden realized that we, we potentially had a theme. So Johnny and I was really, I was asking Johnny for some help with this because I was searching and searching. You know, there's the Monteverdi, but I thought, but neither of us felt like we should be t- going down that road necessarily. And, and so I went to Johnny really to ask him um, for, for some help. And then he, he, he asked James Halliday, the brilliant, um, brilliant librarian for Archangelo, to give us some, some ideas if, there's some, if there was something out there. Because we were both thinking Scarlatti would be, would be the ideal way to go. And um, James came back with several suggestions, and I just couldn't believe it. He'd, I don't think he even knew, he didn't know thematically what we were sort of going for. But out of those suggestions pops this story based on Ariana. And I, I mean, it was, it was just, I don't know. It, I, I couldn't believe how lucky we were in that. Because not only was, was, it, was there this cantata based on Ariana, but it was really good. Mm-hmm. And it was really interesting. I mean, musically had a lot to say. And so from selection, we moved to preparation. You've said elsewhere that you came to music from athletics, that for you, the business of preparing a stage role is partially a physical training program for your body to manage the challenge of inhabiting a character and a personality for several hours on stage. Sticking with the analogy, Ariana's three characters and pieces represented something of a triathlon. How did you prepare? Well... Added to what you're just saying, I was pretty conscious as we all were sitting and planning the scheduling for the recording that it was all going to have to happen very quickly because because of budgetary constrictions. In order to make a recording like this, we had to be able to work in a very focused way and we had a very strict number of days in which we, days and hours (laughs) in which we could make this happen. So not only was I just thinking about how do I, how do I learn this and condition myself, it was also the pacing through the idea that on the first day, we have three hours of Haydn rehearsal. The second day, we have one session in the morning of Handel, I think, and then one session in the afternoon of Scarlatti. The third day, we record the Haydn. So I actually have to be fresh on the third day to record it. The fourth day we recorded the handle for two, three hour sessions, I think. Yeah. And then Friday was the Scarlatti. It was, it was such an intense week to prepare for. And I remember Johnny saying to me, do you, do you think this is possible for you to do this? You know, he's been down the road before where a singer can, you know, commit to that. But then by the final day is really, really starting to struggle. I really didn't want to land in that place. With, with recording thousands of miles, we did that in about three days, but it's different with a, with a piano. Um, and it was a different style of repertoire as well. So I was really thinking about how do I train for endurance? Where and when are the moments where I hold back, not hold back, but I just, I just you know, downshift a bit. And thankfully, Johnny was also just really, really generous and aware of the fact that if there were any places where I could just sort of rest and and bring the body back down, then we would take advantage of that. And there was an added challenge, I think, in that although the orchestration diminished throughout the recording sessions, the focus on the voice only increased. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking how, how it would have been to do it the other way, to start with the smaller ensemble and move to the bigger. But I think we did it the right way because the Haydn was so dramatic and I needed to be able to give a lot to that, not only vocally, but also with the bigger group. Um, they, they also really, really respond to the nuance of what the artist is giving and the emotion. And it's harder with a bigger group to get everybody coordinated. It's, it's not about a mechanical coordination, it's an emotional coordination that you need to achieve very quickly. And the Haydn was really emotional. And Johnny brilliantly wanted it to feel, especially in its most intense moments, he wanted it to feel that it was on the brink of falling apart. 
And so we had to get to the point where everybody understood that it was okay. It was okay to sort of take that risk that actually, even if it went to um, a scary place or a slightly ugly place, like that could be really, really interesting and we could create that. But even when we recorded something like the Haydn, we would map out where, what are, what's the first chunk of, of this cantata that we wanna do. So we didn't record it in order. In fact, I really looked at it and said, okay, what takes the most um, vocal stamina here? And then and, and we, we sort of jumped around in the way that we recorded it, just to, just to think about and prepare for not just that day, but the, the coming days. So yeah, by the time we got to the final day, I was, I was very vocally tired. Well, I can't say I was very vocally tired. The voice was doing okay. I was physically tired, actually. I think it was mentally tired. But it required the Scarlatti because it, it was actually so much more exposed. It required a lot of attention to color of the voice, but I didn't necessarily have to sing loudly all the time to get mm. that. And of course, as usual, after all the planning and preparation, things turn out to be a little bit different in a recording studio to how you think they're going to be. And in these sessions, something did happen quite early on, which almost wrong footed us, something we hadn't quite prepared for. Yeah, well, what was funny is that I, um, I wasn't worried vocally about the Haydn because actually the Haydn stylistically is the closest to sort of my bread and butter repertoire of Mozart. Um, what was interesting was Johnny was saying beforehand, the Haydn is going to be the hardest one to record. It's going to be the beast. It's going to be the hardest day. But what was quite interesting is that we got through that really easily that day. I mean, obviously it's because Johnny's fantastic. I think also the musicians really put their all into it. I felt in the first day when we first sat down for rehearsals, I felt this sort of sense from the musicians of, all right, we'll see about this. <laughs> we'll see about this piece. Wait, one of Haydn's students finished this for him or orchestrated this for him? Hmm, I don't know. But something really shifted. And then I, and you can really feel it from a group when everybody all of a sudden becomes, becomes quite invested in the experience. And I think people really came in, there was a real intense focus. And strangely enough, I think the hardest day of recording was, was the second day, it was Handel. Because I think we were so high from the first day that we were physically more tired. And I think my stamina that I definitely, I remember there was a certain point in the day where I probably, I was thinking, I probably should just take a break right now. Because <laughs> you just know when you're sort of fighting against your mind more than anything. So that, I think the handle was the toughest day. It didn't mean that it wasn't fun, but it was, I think that was the most challenging day. And then the Scarlatti was, I mean, yeah, we were all sort of tired by Friday, but, but because it was a smaller group, we were also able to sort of relax a little bit more. It's less people to have to, to coordinate. And we were able, we just felt that we had more time. I don't know, maybe we were all just looking forward to the glass of wine. I'm pretty sure that the only photo I saw of you and Johnny after the sessions featured a bottle, never mind a glass of wine. But that brings us on to photographs. There's some really striking photography on the front of Ariana. And we can reveal to anyone who's not yet twigged that is indeed you out there on those rocks. But we should also confess that it wasn't the Naxos coast that we visited for the photo shoot or indeed anywhere near the Mediterranean. No, it wasn't. It was, um, it was right down the street from us in Ruddingdean, uh, down the street from Brighton. Yeah, I, we found this wonderful photographer, Richard Bull, who lives in Hove. Uh, close by. So he did some initial searching. I knew somehow I wanted rocks incorporated in it. I thought maybe I'd be lying in rocks. And then he found this passage of these rocks going out to the sea with a sign right there saying, do not climb on the rocks. <laughs> um, and he said, he said, we need to find a day that's slightly overcast. And so he said, all right, during this you know, week, I might just be watching the weather and send you a message the night before and say, we should get up and do it tomorrow morning. <laughs> so he, yeah, so he sent me a message the night before and I think it was a Monday morning and it was overcast 
and the rain was coming in. And thankfully, my husband came along to help out with Richard's equipment and all of that. And I put my trainers on and climbed up these rocks and it was cold and windy and slippery and it was, it was a bit scary. Well, coming back in from the coals to the warmth of the listening room, do you have a favourite moment on the recording? You know, there is, there is a moment, yeah, when we were recording the handle and that was, that was a day when we were quite tired, but when we were recording the handle and the take that landed on the disc um, for the very first aria, A Crudel, the moment which just reminded me how special it can be to work in this really intense focused way with musicians happened at the return of the A section. And Johnny, I had no idea what was gonna happen. I start the line, And he just didn't, he just let it keep going and going and going and going. And I'll never forget that because he just trusted in pushing it just a few steps beyond what we thought sort of was possible. And there were those little moments everywhere in the music making where he'd allow it to just, just step step just beyond what we think we should do and do something slightly different. And I think it's those moments because you just, you think that's where something really interesting happened and you wouldn't necessarily do that so sort of unprescribed in a concert unless you really knew that the person was up for it because you're also wanting them to have breath to get through the phrase, but you could do it in a moment like that and find something that just works brilliantly. We're coming towards the end of the podcast, but before we sail away from Naxos, a silly question. Kate Lindsay, if you could be stuck on a remote Mediterranean island with only one classical composer for company, who would it be? That's tough because I wouldn't want to, I'm not sure I'd want to be with somebody that maybe would be like too, you know, overly energized that would exhaust me every day you know i think i think mozart would be a little too high energy for me i think i think the mind would just be you know and maybe a little messy i'm not sure i don't want to have to clean up after (laughs) looking after a two-year-old as you do probably gives you all too close an insight into mozart's nature are there other composers about whom you know or understand less who uh, you might be interested to discover more about well, I've, I've really enjoyed, when I've been working on music, I've actually really enjoyed trying to get into musicians' heads. And actually, maybe that's probably why it's hard for me. I'm not sure that I want to be on an, <laughs> on an island with any composer, to be totally honest. Um, but like Berlioz, you know, they're, they're all sort of tormented in their own ways. And so, so that could be a pretty tough existence. Um, I've always you know, been fascinated with Mahler, but I've been really fascinated with Alma Mahler for many years, reading her diaries as well and books about her. WC, I've read quite a lot about. I don't, when, I'm prepare, when I'm preparing programs, I, I like to try to get into the heads of the composers a bit, and I like to know what they were doing and what was happening in their lives when they, when they composed that piece, because it helps inform me what was actually important to them. So sorry, I'm not giving you a very, I'm not giving you a very catchy answer on this. No, but you are perhaps giving your fans some tantalising clues as to your next recording. Zemlinsky and Vile got you to Haydn, Handel and Scarlatti. Where do you think Handel, Haydn and Scarlatti might take you next? This disc made me really, really hungry to do more Scarlatti. But then I think, well, would that be too safe to do as, as a next disc, to be honest? Would that be sort of too obvious? But it's, it's really beautiful stuff. And I think, it's, um, I think there, there's a lot, a lot there to be discovered that has not been recorded at all, hasn't been touched. So I think there's, there's something in that. But I think probably I feel a pull a pull a bit towards some French repertoire because Thousands of Miles was very much English German based and the Ariana has it was very much you know is is it the Italian repertoire 
And so I'm wondering, I'm wondering if, you know, Berlioz and that whole zone also has been, has, has been on my mind for a long time as well. Um, Gluck, um, looking at some of that is quite interesting to me. Um, it's in the, it's in the works. It takes these things. I, yeah, they take time. Could an enterprising and committed, helpful fan help you by making suggestions via social media? I would love that, actually. I'd love, I'd love to have ideas and suggestions from people. I, I like to be taken down other paths. Well, we've reached the end of the first Archangelo podcast, and it only remains to thank all of you very much for listening, and to thank our very special guest, Kate Lindsay, for joining us. Kate, thank you very much indeed, and I hope that we'll be making music again before too long. Oh, I hope it will be sooner rather than later. <laughs>